Welcome to this online uh, lesson. My name is Paul Voucher. I'm a professor at the University of Applied Science in Switzerland. And we've prepared this uh, lesson to give a bit of insight on how does a COVID-19 pandemic influence our practice and what can we do uh, to work in safety. I would uh, also like to thank uh, Richard Collomb, who's a chemist engineer and specialized in uh, quality and uh, hygiene who really helped me work out through the different uh, elements. A whole load of people uh, have also contributed and I'm really looking forward to share this with you. So let's get going. The plan is um, we're going to go through different chapters which will give a deeper sight in what we do. Main idea being is if you understand the basics, well, uh, hygiene measures and quality, it's 20% of knowledge and 80% of common sense. So I'm going to try and transfer as best I can these 20%. So we'll go through each of these sections and feel free to move through the slides as you need to and get back to some information if that's necessary. What's the aim of the lesson? Well, we would like you osteopaths um, to have the appropriate approach and the proportion measures to limit the spread of the COVID-19 um, during your professional activities and we're particularly concerned with this because we can't keep a distance of two meters with our patients so social distancing is difficult. What are the specific objectives? Well I hope that by the end of this lesson you'll be able to recognize the basic characteristics of the virus and describe how this virus is propagated through the population between people and even within someone. I also would like you to be able to assess the risk according to specific attributes and these are specific to each situation within your office and with each patient. I would also like to suggest some hygiene procedures that are specific to each situation. So it's mainly the ideas and the framework. So then, then with the documents that we will give you, you'll be able to do this on your own. So let's go. Here's the first chapter where we're going to get into this beast and see a bit more detail of what is SARS-CoV-2 and how does it move from one person to another. First thing to know is these things are really small. When I mean small, that's small. Here we've got the flu virus. The flu virus is an influenza. It's slightly smaller than the coronavirus, which is about 100 nanometers big. So if we scale that up on this log scale, where each step is 10 times smaller than the one before, we can see that compared to the atom, our, nan our coronavirus is only about 1,000 times bigger. If we scale up again to 1,000 times, we arrive at 100 nanometers, uh, which is about the size of a human egg just after fecundation and slightly bigger than an animal cell. If we scale that up again of 1,000 times, well then we arrive at the size of an ostrich egg. In other words, our virus is about 1 million times smaller than, a, than an egg. Why is it so small? Well, because it doesn't need to be big, and we'll see why later on. What is the virus, and how does it propagate, and what makes it a coronavirus? What is a coronavirus? A virus is just a whole sum of um, molecules set together on a very basic pr principle, a bit like if you were playing with Duplos. And all this is because the virus can't reproduce itself. It needs a host and it just injects its um, nucleids acid into a cell and it lets the other one do it for it. So that means viruses need hosts. And these, the coronavirus has as a host usually mammals. Bats and rodents are the most frequent ones, but we've seen other mammals carry coronavirus, such as the camel or the pandolin, which we believe is the origin of the actual um, SARS-CoV-2 virus, because when we analyze genetically the one that's infecting humans, it's 99% close to the pandolin, or it only shares about 77% common uh, gene characteristic with the bat. So as we can see, we've had lots of coronaviruses before. It's something quite well known in, uh, in life form. However, quite seldomly, it shifts over to man and then it can be more or less devastating because of where it attacks us and what it does. And this is why it's important to know what's specific about the SARS-CoV-2. Here's the beast. 
the small nano element that's putting the world upside down. Right in the center, you've got the genetic load, which is a nucleocapsid that can be sent within other cells to have the virus replicated. Because as we said before, SARS is a bit lazy and it uses a host to reproduce it. Around it is a lipo, um, a, a lipid structure with um, uh, glycoproteins that are set within it. This balance makes it quite unstable and very sensitive both to time and other agents, meaning that viruses usually don't live very long. Uh, at least coronaviruses, uh, this coronavirus doesn't. It has an average uh, survival rate of only one to two days within the human body and out of the human body depending on the temperature this can go up to about a week. The other element that's important to recognize is its surface receptors like any other virus uh, it needs one of these to be able to link to different cells and enter them. The specific receptor for the SARS-CoV-2 structure is the angiotensin converting enzyme 2 receptor which is present in all the cells that we need that are sensitive to angiotensin. So it's about all those that have are rich in vessels. This is particularly the case for our nose, throat, lungs, but once the virus gets inside, it's also the kidneys and even the brain. So how does the virus come into the body and replicate? Well, first of all, you need a certain amount of viruses for them to be able to link to the specific targets they want to. Once this is done, the virus will link to the receptor, go through its membrane, release its R um, RAN, and have the ribosomes from that cells produce the, the virus. It will expel these viruses, which then will in turn infect the neighboring cells and continue this cycle. We therefore have an exponential growth in viruses, and this explains uh, uh, the period of time where we don't have any symptoms but we're already infected. Once our immune system will respond, this will, will, will diminish the ability of the virus to be able to replicate and it's a never-ending war between our immune system and the virus's ability to replicate in the, in, in the cells. To understand propagation and viruses and measures to prevent it, we really have to have a clearer vision on the dynamics of transmission. And to do this, we need to be able to see the population and see how the virus propagates. What's difficult with our uh, COVID-19 disease is that it affects a whole range of people with different levels of symptoms, from people of having very mild symptoms, a slightly running no nose, a, a, a feeling of soreness in the throat that people don't even notice, two very severe conditions that lead to death. Now we have very good data on the top part, on the deaths and the severe cases, a bit less on what's lower down. So what we're going to try and understand is what does this have as a consequence in your day-to-day -day life um, interactions with your patients? Well, I think Geneva um, gave us a, a better view of what's going on. In Geneva, on the 21st of April, we had 4,710 confirmed official accumulated cases. So these were all the people who were tested for which we detected the virus um, within samples drawn either from nose or throat. Now what's interesting is they've done a study where they took a, a sample of the entire population and they tested these people as well. And what they found is that it was about 5% of the entire population that had uh, in fact been uh, contaminated by the, by the virus. So this means that 80% of infected people uh, were carriers of the virus without knowing it because they hadn't been diagnosed with, um, with the COVID-19. So this also means that among the, pa and the people or the general people, um, there's a lot of people who've had the COVID-19 without actually knowing it. If they come to your office and they've got signs of flu or so on, they actually could be carriers. Now this is much less likely now because there are less people, uh, because we've all been social isolated, but it could emerge again. But it makes it really difficult to know who's infected and who's not. Well, just to make things harder, the virus has another trick up its sleeve to make it harder to detect. Here we have a graph and we can see what is the viral load of the virus um, within people who have been contaminated. Day zero is the onset of symptoms. We can see that before that, we don't know the person is sick because they don't manifestate any symptoms. And after that, we can start detecting who might be sick. And actually, 
We do know for now that people are most contagious two days before and two days after the onset. And about 44% of people who have been contaminated by the COVID virus were done before any symptoms appeared. So many people can contaminate other without us knowing that they're infected and without themselves knowing that they are infected. And this makes the spread of the disease much um, easier and also it explains why we weren't able to control it so well right from the start. The good news is that the infectious or the virus load diminishes with time and we can see that after the eighth day the viral load is low enough um, for normally people not to be contagious anymore. This is however not valid for other liquids like those coming from the lungs or the stools which can remain contagious for up to 20 days. So we've seen how can we measure and know things about the virus. We've seen what the dynamics are with the viral load. So when is it contagious? And now we're going to see how does it pass from one person to another. Well, viruses tend to use a vector which is very often uh, through um, our saliva. So it's through coughing, droplets, and also airborne molecules. The smaller a virus is, the more likely it is to become volatile, so it stays up in the air, and the larger it is, the more it tends to rest down onto the ground. The coronavirus is quite a big virus, so it tends to drop down and it doesn't stay in the air for very long. So if we look at the coronavirus, the most the, the, uh, likely way of contaminating one person from another is from coughing, um, from also sneezing, but also when talking, having small droplets that fly through the air and then maybe will uh, land straight on somebody and it has to be able to enter. The entrance is through the mouth, the nose or the eyes. <clears throat> the direct contact with the hand, so if, I, if I, I sneeze on my hand, pass it to someone else's hand and then they touch their eyes or so on, will be a very good vector for the disease and that's a known vector. One vector that's a bit less known is called the indirect contact. So that means that instead of directly touching someone with my hand to their hand, there's an object in between. So imagine I'm using a glass, I'm touching the glass, drinking from it, giving it to someone else. Well, there's questions like, can I become infected only by touching the glass and then putting my, my hand to my mouth? Can I get infected by drinking from the glass and then contacting where the other person has touched the glass? So <clears throat> these different vectors are possible, they're likely because we know that there's a viral load that can be maintained on these surfaces, but there's no direct proof that there have been some infections through these uh, vectors, and if they exist, they're much less important than the one through the hand or the direct droplets. This doesn't prevent us from taking measures to, um, to make sure that we, can't, we will not transmit diseases through such uh, means. So we're going to take a bit of time uh, in this lesson to address these indirect contact, knowing that the main efforts have to be targeted in keeping the proper distance between people because the droplets can't go that far and also making sure that people's hands are clean because they tend to cough, touch themselves, touch their face and then touch someone else. Let's get back to this notion of droplets and airborne. So social distancing, we give a distance and it's a two meter indication. This is valid if people are static, if they're sitting down or not moving. As soon as someone moves, they will drift through the air and if they cough, well, their droplets will not follow them forever. Wherever they go, they'll tend to drift behind them. So if you're following someone, well, you'll be, you'll be potentially be able to breathe the air they're in because they're moving through and you're moving as well. Also, if you have drift, so if you have uh, an open window or some wind, this will carry the droplets and bring them much further than a two meters. Uh, here's an example from a study where they looked at how the droplets uh, remained in the air and what they've noticed is if someone is running at about 15 kilometers an hour, the safety distance is not of two meters, but of 10 meters straight behind the runner. If you move sideways by two meters, you're out uh, uh, of this distance. What do we retain for our office? Well, in our office, you need to have patients stay at least two meters apart in your waiting room. And if you do so, it's very important that there's no drift, but also when you're walking with patients, or if patient, or one patient might cross another one, well, these distances might have to be a bit 
bigger or it's more about time waiting for one person to move out before the next one coming in. So now let's think about this virus. So what we've seen is that there's a viral load and it's the amount of viruses that are present that can contaminate someone, but also that that virus um, is quite unstable as we saw on the surface of the, of the cells. Uh, are lipids and glycoproteins and this makes them quite unstable. So now let's consider how long can the virus survive on different types of surfaces. Uh, this will define also of the cleaning or what importance, what material I want to use, what, which ones I should be quite careful, which ones do I need to disinfect more often and so on. So first of all, well the main rule is uh, the virus actually likes smooth surfaces. So elements like glass, plastic or stainless steel are the ones that will be most favorable uh, to maintain the contamination from a virus. Stainless steel being the highest, which unfortunately is often the taps and the different elements that we're using to wash our hands. So this is a particular target to be um, uh, aware of and to be careful with. The one with the lowest is the wood because it's an organic matter, it's porous and the, and the virus will come down into the wood and make it less likely that when we touch we have a load of uh, a virus that will be applied. Now let's look on the other side, on the right side of, uh, <coughs> of the slide and see different materials that we're using in day-to-day -day use. So paper surfaces such as handkerchiefs but also paper sheets that you might be using um, on your table. Well, the virus only survives less than 30 minutes. It's the same thing about on cloth material where you have a small droplet that would fall on it. Um, this is because all these substances are porous and um, the virus will enter inside the, the, the tissue, make it much less likely to come out and be in contact, but also because of the properties of these tissues, the deterioration of the virus will be much faster. You'll, <clears throat> the mask, however, can be contagious for two to four days. You'll say, but why? The main difference being is that through the mask you have high concentration of, of water um, and of viruses because you're breathing and repeating um, the presence of, of the virus. Whereas on cloth and paper surfaces you might have less material. So all these numbers are indicative. They're set with a preset amount of viruses in the initial load. In reality you might have some higher concentration than others on the contaminated liquids. So the higher it is uh, dissolved, the less likely it is to be able to transmit. What does this mean for my office? Well, let's take wood for example. You might have a wooden floor. Uh, the likelihood of a virus being able to contaminate someone else is very unlikely. Someone would have to touch the surface nearly immediately after someone put a high level of either coughing on the wood or cough or other elements that could fall on it. On the other hand, if you pass some water, simple water and you dilute it on the wood surface, that spread over it on a short period of time, you're sure that it won't be infectious. So cleaning wood with only water is a suitable measure to be able to fight against the virus. Now let's go to the stainless steel tap. Well, on the tap, probably using uh, simple measures wouldn't, uh, wouldn't be sufficient. It stays for four days. It's a place where lots of people touch it. Probably there it's better to use a disinfectant and also ask people not to touch the tap with their own hand, but maybe with a paper surface or a tissue, which can be put in a bin outside. Let's go down now to the last uh, elements toward the banknote. Banknotes can hold viruses for one day, which means that cash flow and bringing money from one person to another is probably not the best idea during this period. Now let's have a look how our virus behaves when we expose it to usual disinfectants. Well, there's some good news there because it, it actually is very vulnerable to any form of disinfectant. And this is because of this balance between the glycoprotein, the lipid surface, which makes that the lipids are easily dissolved by soap, but also that these bindings are quite fragile to any form of uh, disinfectant. So that goes from bleach to soap to ethanol or other elements. We recommend using ethanol as a um, glyco, uh, glyco alcoholic, um, a hydroalcoholic solution, uh, which is quite easy to use and makes it possible to also disinfect your hands when touching instruments and, and doing different elements during the care you provide. It's also, um, however, soap works extremely well 
and so patients might also wash their hands with soap before starting the consultation. So we've seen how the virus can be fragile to different types of surfaces, and we've also seen how it can be affected by disaffectant. The last parameter we would like to see is how is it affected by temperatures. And the virus likes it when it's cold and doesn't like heat. And this is because of the lipid uh, surface and because the stability of the proteins weaken with temperature. So at 22 degrees, we can say that the virus um, is um, detectable for, this, for sev uh, about seven days. The infectiousity is considered that when you have less than 100,000 units, so 100,000 viruses per milliliter, then the con it's not contagious anymore. So we can see by the seventh day, it's not contagious anymore. If we go up to 37 degrees, we can see that it's not contagious anymore after one day. How is this possible? Because people are sick for up to 20 days. This is because it's not the same viruses that's affecting them. There's a cycle, and in the body the cycle lasts less than a day, which means that the viruses infect host cells and reproduce and release new viruses. If the, if the cycle is broken and the person can't produce virus anymore, well then after one day inside their body uh, they would not have any virus left. At 70 degrees, well, there it's about less than five minutes. So we can see the temperature for cleaning different uh, objects, whether it's the washing machine uh, or the dishwashing machine, or we can see that they're very efficient in getting rid of the virus. So once you take things out of the wash, everything is fine. So what do we have to remember about the virus? Well, here's some key points that will help us also take the right decisions in minimizing risks with our patients. The first one is that all patients and yourself are potentially infected. We have no way of knowing it or not, although the risks are lower if there are fewer people that are infected. But potentially, we're all infected. The second one is that the main vector of contamination is a droplet through direct or indirect contact. The third point to remember is that SARS-CoV-2 is potentially contagious between 30 minutes to 7 days depending of surfaces, so we will have different behaviours and measures depending of the surfaces. And the virus does not stay in the air for long and it is easy to disinfect. When it comes to a small, tiny little virus that causes such a chaos in our society, well, we can call it a threat. Now, what can we do about these threat? The first thing is to have a form of policy where we can manage the risk. That means that we can control what was going on and try and reduce the impact of what's going on. And this is what all this is about. So, let's go through this a bit. And first of all, what is risk management? So what is risk analysis? How do I manage things and what do I have to think about? Well, there are three levels to consider for the risks of the transmission of the coronavirus. One is at the individual level, so it's person to person and the risk related to people. The second is at an organizational level, which is all the structure and how you're organized, how people might cross each other at different places and to what extent um, what they touch and interact with could contaminate them. And the third one is the endemic level, which is what proportion of the population at, um, are concerned by the virus and therefore what is the overall risk of, a, of being contaminated. So let's tackle the first one. Individual level. Well, at the individual level, we can either have a risk of infecting someone else, so that's through droplets or maybe through our hands, and there's the risk of being infected. And this risk assessment is different because it's related to different risks, types of risk. So let's start with the first one. Let's first see what the level of risk for being infected. So what, when we're talking about these risks, it's not the risk of actually developing or having the disease, it's also all its consequences. As we've seen, some people might even have very slow symptoms, so they don't mind catching it, whether others will probably die from it. So what we're trying to do is diminish the load of the disease and the consequences it has on human beings. And for that reason, we've, we've defined 
a whole set of population that are vulnerable. They're vulnerable because they're at risk of developing complications from the disease. So this is the level one risk uh, for, for, for people that we have to avoid, and it's the risk where we want these people not to be infected. Vulnerable people are those who have not been contaminated priorly by the COVID-19 or have not developed an immunity, and that they have risk factors which is usually related to disease um, with <coughs> uh, that, that are linked to the angio uh, tensine uh, receptors. So it, it's diabetes, cardiovascular disease, immunodepressed patients, cancer under treatment, and chronic lung diseases. To that we could also add people with kidney failures or other forms of diseases that are concerned by the vascular system. These people are the ones for which we have to put the highest level of precautions as it's very important that they're not contaminated. The level two of risk is the other non-humanized people. In other words, all the rest of the, nearly all the rest of the people except those that have developed immunity. Um, the level three of risk is the low humanized people. And here I think I have to give a few explanation on how does it work. So what we have noticed up to now is that about 20% of patients who have gone through different phases, including also in the emergency departments, do not develop an immune system on the Ig. Uh, lymphocyte system. So they don't have any IgMs or IgG that are detectable at the end, which means the immune system got, um, got rid of the disease through other mechanisms, probably other forms of lymphocytes, but also the, um, all the, uh, uh, all the uh, reactions that can get rid of it. It's more like there's not a memory uh, of that infection. And these people are inclined to potentially become infected again. Mm. So that means we have low immunized people, which are people who have a very low rate. This also hap happens naturally over time with this type of virus because our immune memory uh, uh, loses strength with time. And usually after one or two years, we don't have any IgMs and IgG left. And if we're infected over again, we will develop the disease as we did the first time. And the last category of risk are immunized people. So these are the people with IgMs and IgGs, which is usually following uh, an efficient uh, vaccination procedure or following an infection with a patient that has developed IgMs and IgGs. The IgMs and IgGs are quite easy to detect. It's a simple drop of blood on, on an ELISA test where we can test both. It's a rapid test. We have the answer quite straightforwardly and it lets us know whether or not we're protected from an infection. The second um, level of risk to be able to evaluate is the risk of infecting someone else. And this really depends of a whole load of factors. As, we, as we've seen, 44% of people um, infect others at the period where they don't have any symptoms, so they often don't really know they're sick. So we've set out a whole set of measures to be able to evaluate these risks a bit better. And I've set them out here over here. So the level number one is someone that has confirmed infection. So usually they will have a test that can be either on, on their um, RN test, on samples from their mouth and throat, but there's confirmed presence of uh, uh, the virus. And often be given that they're tested, they have symptoms because it's taken from sample. Doesn't necessarily have to be the case in this risk number one. If they don't have symptoms, I'd still leave them in risk number one. But if they have symptoms, their risk might even be a bit higher because they will be maybe coughing and they'll have more expectorations which can contaminate other people. So this is a patient with a known case of COVID-2 and that's symptomatic. Risk number two is someone that has symptoms that evoke the coronavirus but uh, and people that have been in contact with a confirmed case. So they're very likely to be infected but there's no confirmation from the lab. The, risk, the third level of risk is people that have been in contact with a confirmed case, but they don't have any symptoms. Uh, this can occur during a lapse of 14 days. The, <clears throat> the risk of um, uh, being contaminated and developing the disease usually it takes about seven days. What we do know is people are only contagious during the last two days, but often we don't know when we are in these last two days, which means that we have to assume that the patient could be already contagious uh, and this is a, a person at risk. The risk number four is someone that has been in contact with uh, uh, without symptoms, or contact with someone with symptoms. Again, 
There are many, many other uh, diseases that circulate, uh, viral or non-viral, that provoke um, coughing and similar symptoms. And sometimes the level of risk uh, is attenuated because so many other people have these symptoms. They're more likely to have coronavirus, but they're much more likely to have another disease. The fifth level of the risk is where the main part of the population is. It's people that don't have symptoms and don't uh, have anyone close to them who either has symptoms or was a confirmed case. And the last category is the risk level six, which is people who have acquired immunity. <clears throat> so these people are very unlikely to be infected because they already have, have been, and if they become contaminated, the immune system usually repels the virus before it develops any symptoms or that the viral load is high enough to be able to contaminate other people. Now that we've seen how to manage risks at an individual level, let's go to the second part and start looking at how can we analyse organisational level risks. These are related to your practice and the way it works, so it's quite specific. Examples are if you're working alone, if you're working with other colleagues, with other disciplines, where is your office, how do people get to your office, and so on. Here we've got a few examples of different uh, uh, elements that you might want to have a look at and, that, and different things that you can do to reduce the risk at your office. Let's start off with the top element, wash hands. So different elements you can consider is where can people wash their hands? How do they do it? How do they reduce their risk of being contaminated while they do this? And so on. You also might think of availability of hygiene material whether it's disinfectant, uh, masks, or other material that you have. And it also brings other questions. Do I have enough material to be able uh, to give one to each patient or not? A third element is about assuring traceability. Do I have the means to be able to see the patient I've seen in two previous days? And have I given opportunities for patients to be able to report to me if they do become sick? Then maybe there's it at the waiting room. Uh, how is it organized? Am I able to remove any objects people can touch? Uh, all seats spread apart at two meters to avoid people from being too close. If this is not the case, am I organized for patients not to cross each other and avoid being close? Am I in time so that I make sure that patients don't wait in the waiting room? Also, Maybe I'm reorganizing my schedule and I've tried shifting my time schedule with a colleague so patients aren't coming at the same moment. Or maybe uh, I'm not working anymore with, uh, with a colleague where we would see patients two together. Also, maybe I'm changing the way I'm providing services. I might have been giving courses or showing exercises to more than one patient at a time and I'm reorganizing this. I might have chosen to do online group interventions if, instead of seeing patient face to face. Also, I might have considered or uh, I'm looking to providing home services for patients that are vulnerable to the disease and at risk of developing complications. I might also have a look into how is my office cleaned and can I increase uh, the rhythm or put this at other schedules. Uh, also, can I clean certain elements that are highly at risk, such as doorknobs, buttons, uh, and so on? So as you can see, this is quite specific. And you need to go and look through and have a close analysis of how you usually work to be able to spot where are you at risk. Again, we've, <clears throat> I'll show you afters, but we've got a guide that will help you through this. And this is the endemic level. This is something harder to understand because it fluctuates with time, but when you have a disease like the coronavirus or any vir viral transmission that can propagate from one person to another, and where the survival of the virus depends on this propagation. A virus, uh, if it kills its hosts or if its host becomes immune, it will die in that host, and if most people have killed the virus and it doesn't propagate, that's the programmed death of the virus. So what we're trying to do is diminish um, the 
the number of people infected from each patient and if each person infects less than one person then you'll have a decrease of the number of infected people in the overall population things will go down and if more than one person gets contagious it goes up so with the coronavirus we have an infectious uh, rate of R0 um, that's at 3.3 so each people infects an average 3.3 people which means we have to take quite important measures to reduce that below one such as the social distancing uh, we've had lately. Once that happens, everything goes down. Once you reopen, it goes back up. So what we're planning during the next um, months is that probably we be going back and forth in different measures when we see that the numbers go up and that we become stricter and then we can go down again and so on. And here you can see the line where the blue line corresponds to the number of people with covirus. Co we can see that there the threshold was set at 75 people per 10,000. This is the threshold for hospitals to be able to take in the new cases. So as soon as we reach a certain threshold, we, we ask people to confine and we're more strict. Everything goes down and again and then you can reopen slightly or so on. And depending how good we are during these intermediate phases, it will make that the, the opening is longer or shorter. But it also means that if we look at this graph, we can see that the prevalence of the disease among the patient fluctuates in time. So the chances of a patient having the coronavirus is much higher when we're in, in the beginning of a, um, uh, of a confinement period rather than at the end. And this can also be taken into account into how severe you are into putting up measures such as having patients wear masks and so on. So let's summarize all this. What's risk management? Well, the risk management is about taking all these information, which is about assessing what is the, the risk. And then it's the whole process, which is a continuous adaptation uh, to keep the risk as reasonable as possible. So that means you need to take into account these different factors and there's risk elements. And, but, and you might have an individual level um, uh, measures. You might have contextual. You might have period measures and so on. But it's to have that plasticity and to have a reasonable level of risk. What steps do we go through to, to make this possible? Well, first of all, we need to observe and define the context. We have to know how do we work, what's happening, where are the risk, what are patients doing, what are they touching. Then we have to, and that makes it possible to identify the potential risks, assess their importance, and then prioritize what's the most important, where can I go, where can I have the biggest impact in reducing the risk. Then I can define these measures, I can implement them, and observe to see what happened, is it better, is it working, and so on. So the measures you're going to take and start taking, um, probably for Monday, they're not going to stop there, they're going to continue all along, and they're going to be adapted to the situation. We can also see that there's two different uh, phases in the risk management. There's a form of situation analyze where we try and understand things and plan the elements, and then there's really the possible measures what are we going to do and how this is going to work? And the two following chapters will address both these points. So here we are. We can now go into the action and really start thinking of how am I going to look? What am I going to do in my office? How am I going to feel safe um, for me and for my patients uh, in my, at my work? First thing is observation. So I would advise each one, each one of us to really take the time and to try and think through these different elements. A bit like a meta-cognition um, uh, or take, taking a bit of self-reflection uh, on how does it work and where, where are the risks and what's going on. So to do this, well, first of all, consider patient and see how does he flow through your office. What, what does the patient do? What does, what does he touch? What, where does he go? How does it work? What's the payment method? And so on. And to do this, you can also see how does he take his meeting? Where does he get his information? Um, where does he enter? How does he get into your building? Once he gets there, is there a waiting room? Is it obvious? Does he know where to sit? Uh, do they sit? How long do they sit for? Who comes and get them in the office? Is it one person, two person, three person working? Do they cross each other? Where do they cross each other? They cross the patients. When the patient leaves and he walks down the corridor, who does he meet? What does he do? Where does he go to? Once he's in the office, where does he sit? What does he touch? Uh, or what do they touch? Um, at what distance are they from the office? 
during a consultation what happens where do they get changed where do they put their clothes what do they do where do they what do they touch where do they lay down what do i use as instruments what do i touch during that period um, once the patient leaves how does he pay how do i how does how does he leave what does he touch and so on so that's really the going through the flow and understanding what you're doing through your office the second element is your material and availability what you have do you have masks do you have hydro um, alcoholic solutions where can you get them where can you buy them within the file uh, in the folder that you have access to i put some different documents uh, provided by the svo that will give you addresses where you can order them it's important to have enough stock and to know where they are and how you're going to use them do i have enough to be able to change them every four hours do i want to have some also to give to certain patients uh, uh, patient at risks or, or so on and the last thing to look at is the cleaning procedure uh, what are your resources how often is it done and how will you adapt these to, to the risk so um, will you take uh, measures to be able to disinfect the chairs and, and elements that are touched between each patients or not you're going to do that on a regular basis how are you going to, to set that up and this is also related to the risk assessment so you really need to see what type of patients you're, you, you're seeing what type of patients you want to continue seeing um, are you going to adapt your measures and go and see patients at home or not but what are the underlying risks and what do you want to diminish again to do this take the three levels of risk we've seen just before analyze the entire situation and then take adapted measures where you can target them best there's no good solution that suits everyone each one of you will probably be able to find the best solution for themselves and that leads to the last um, phase which is really the priority what do you want to target to what do you set for yourself as a goal and what elements do you really want to be able to, to set up and put into application and this might require some changes on your agenda the way you work and so on but think of this through before starting think of the whole process and what you need to change because you might still have a bit of time in the following days so now this is the part where what can you do what do you need to do what do you have to do so to help you out we decided to write a guide this guide is available in English French and German it's constantly updated with peer reviewing from uh, from practitioners or any other people who read it and provide us with feedback there's a link up on top of the document if you click on it you can always upload the latest version This is the part where you're going to do your homework. I'm just going to present you a bit the different sections and an overview of how we constructed the guidelines. But then you'll need to read through it on your own uh, and try and find out what's the best solutions for your, your situation. So we organized the document in four different sections. First one is about managing patients. This is an important thing because it's also about what are you going to tell patients uh, before they attend your office? How are you going to reorganize uh, different elements to make sure that they're aware of what they need to do when they come and see you? The second part is more about managing the office. So this is how you're going to set up the place and welcome your patients in a, a safe environment. So it can be about uh, moving the furniture and arranging the waiting room but also other elements uh, such as your own consultation room. The, the third section is about self hygiene. So what measures do you need to take for yourself, both for your own safety, but also for the patient's safety. And the last one is about how do you actually go around cleaning the off office and the instruments uh, around you. So that can give also indications on how often do you do it and with what type of uh, products. So again, just Download the document and go through, through it and read the different uh, suggestions and then try and find what's be the best uh, solution for yourself. Within the document, you'll also find a checklist. And I think this is more about uh, the importance of you setting clear goals. Um, some countries have set up protection plans uh, which are guided. Here, what you can do is really set up your own plan for your, for your own office. So that means that you need to think through things after you've read the document and having a clear view of what you can do is set up these procedures. Um, you don't necessarily have to do it by writing. Also, often it's quite good if you're working 
uh, with other colleagues to put this down by writing so it makes it quite quite clear. This is a 22 different steps that you can check and make sure that you've done uh, the essentials. So I'll let you again go through the documents and, 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 and read, read it and then use the checklist once you've thought of solu uh, solutions to make sure that you've covered everything that is essential. Now another thing is COVID-19 is something new. Uh, it will evolve. The guidelines that have been given to you today might change in the future, even though we'll try and keep the document up to date. But it's also important for you to understand the disease, its dynamics. An example might be suddenly a new vaccine is available and you want to know where it is and, does it, and how efficient it is and so on to be able to inform your patients correctly. So there's different sources uh, that are available and we're going to cover a few of these right now. The first one is the guide. So here's um, uh, the link that you can go to it. It's on switch drive. So this is a cloud, uh, a secured cloud from universities in Switzerland. And this link is always valid for you to be able to download the latest version of the PDF file. Once you have one file, you can always use this link, which is on top uh, of the document. Other sources, uh, well, most of them are on internet. I've done a small list here. Uh, it, it could grow and become bigger, uh, especially that many countries now are writing guidelines. The first two up on top uh, are guidelines that have been provided in osteopathy. The first one was in Switzerland. The second one is in France. Uh, the second section we can see about overview of the situation and, and these are links of uh, big organizations that make, make it possible for you to have a, a clear view of what's going on with the virus, what, the, what is the dynamic of the disease. I also provided two sources for update which are really good links that give you then further links to other sites and, and instructions, usually always with very relevant information. This seems very important in the time when uh, a lot of the news is propagated by social media and it's often uh, changed or deformed and, and brought more to sen give, providing sensation to the news rather than really basing it on what we do know and what can we do from there. I've also given you links to reviews. Um, these reviews are Cochrane reviews and give you the latest update on what are we doing and what's going on. The first one is on acute care if it interests you and you want to know uh, what patients are, are at risk for and what type of treatment is provided. Second one maybe concerns us a bit more because it's about control and, and prevention. And I've given you a whole series of journal links. All these journals have set up special pages on, on uh, COVID-19. So you really can get the latest publications and update. And the scientific community has made things available for free and are working really fast to make it possible for people to be informed as fast as possible. Well, that's about it. I hope you now have the basic elements you need to be able to set up your own plan. All this material was brought in a collaborative approach between many partners and we've noticed that working together really does improve both patient safety but also the quality of what we provide. So I'd like to thank a few of our partners, the Swiss Osteopathy Science Foundation who funded a part of uh, uh, all the work that we've done, but also to Coma Center for Osteopathic Medicine Collaboration, who've really created this culture of sharing and improving uh, what we do. So thank you very much for your attention, and I hope you'll, you'll be able to work in safe conditions and also uh, find the best plan uh, for yourself.